Uh, welcome back. It's good to see a bit more of attendance to uh, in, in presence in, in, in this auditorium. Uh, thank you to the Kiro for coming and visiting us. As you say, uh, this is your first trip, in the international trip in quite a while. So Ichiro is both a theoretical and observational cosmologist. Uh, brief uh, CV, if you, if you allow me. So in 2001, you had a thesis in Tohoku in Japan, uh, were mentored by Peter Massey and David Spergel. And Michael is actually very revealing, the pursuit of non-Gaussianity in the CMB. All right, so this has been, we have been pushing along that axis for quite a while since then. Uh, just for, sorry. Well, I'm doing the best I can. <laughs> uh, I, I know I have a small voice, but anyway. So right after this, he went to Princeton and worked on the, in the WMAP team, which in particular David Spergel, of course, again, uh, till 2004, when you moved to the University of Texas at Austin. And then you had a stellar career from assistant to associate, and then professor, and then director of the Texas Cosmology Center, from which you jump uh, to the directorship of the Max Planck, while uh, still having a very, developing very strong tie with the IPMU, which is the Institute of Physics and Mathematics of the Universe from the University of Tokyo, which is also a Kevin Center. Uh, Ichiro has got many prizes, which are along the line of the, in particular, the theoretical inter the interpretation for theories of, uh, of the CMB data, and in particular, the WMAP data, where he was really part of. And just to name one of the latest prizes, the Inoue Prize, which is very prestigious in 2001, which was for critical tests of theories of the early universe using the CMB. So we are very much into the same line. And today he is also telling us where how about cosmic refringence, which is also again using the CMB in the future uh, to help us with certain theories. And I forgot to mention that, among other things, Ichiro is also very involved in the satellite project led by Japan, which is called Lightbird, which I think you're instrument scientist, is that, or, or what is uh, the title? I forgot the exact Project scientist. Project scientist, <laughs> whatever. So uh, a role I'm sort of familiar with <laughs> and uh, wish you luck. And now we'll uh, listen to you. Thank you very much. Thank, thank you all for coming. I know that I'm using uh, one of the two days of your precious time that you can actually come to the Institute these days, right? So, ah, okay, okay, good. <laughs> excellent, excellent, okay, okay, yeah. So this is my first international trip outside of Germany since the pandemic. Very emotional, frankly. Uh, so much looking forward to this opportunity to uh, physically speaking to people. I can probably get the real feedback on what I'm doing and uh, this kind of scientific interaction was really, I really missed it. Plus, I really missed uh, my favorite brasserie in Riga. Yes, I just went there and I was like, gosh, I missed this so much. <laughs> uh, great. So I'm, I'm already enjoying them myself very much. So today's topic is very much like what I've been doing broadly speaking, namely trying to get as much science as possible out of a given data set, being creative about data analysis. So these are the kind of things that you wouldn't have thought of doing uh, when the uh, experiments are designed, but uh, if you be a little bit creative about it, you can extract a lot of science and maybe hopefully will lead to some exciting discovery. So this talk is based upon two papers that we published in uh, phys Physical Review Letters. And uh, there you go. So uh, the question is a standard one. We know that standard model of cosmology, lambda CGM, requires new physics. We have to always remember that. It's uh, uh, excellent evidence for physics beyond the standard model. What is dark matter? What is dark energy? What generated the initial fluctuation in the early universe? So all of these really can be answered by polarization of the CMB. So that's the key. Temperature, you know, uh, we know very well. Polarization is the next generation. And uh, so we use cosmic biofringence to answer the question, what is that matter dark energy? And we also use B mode polarization to answer what power the Big Bang, what is the physics behind inflation? So we have two epochs. 
So what you're looking at is the um, lighter cone. So as you go farther back, uh, sorry, as you look more distant, uh, you look farther in the past. And then, so as you go from right to the left, the, uh, not only you are getting farther away in distance, but also the universe is getting younger. Then you have this surface of lots of scattering when the, the uh, universe became transparent to photons. That's the moment when polarization was created because for generation of polarization requires scattering. And this is more or less for most of the photons, uh, 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 more than 90% of the photons, this would be the moment of the last of scattering. This was the last time that the polarization could have been generated. So that's what we see. Then if you use that as a boundary condition and use laws of physics to go backward in time even further, you are probing the early universe, what powered the Big Bang. That's what you do with B model polarization. But today's topic is this, okay? So how light propagated in the universe uh, over 13 to 14 billion years. So usually, right, when you have this electric field oscillating one direction, that's a polarization, and we typically assume that that direction doesn't change. But what if something happens to the photons that will rotate the plane of linear polarization. What if you had polarization pattern at the surface of lots of scattering 14 billion years ago? Over the time, the incredible amount of time, the tiny effects of rotating plane of linear polarization accumulates, giving you something that you can observe. So plane of linear polarization may be rotated by an angle beta. Why can't we do that? So before we get in, go into the results of uh, Planck experiments, let me just tell you that methodology development took two years, okay? <laughs> probably more than two years. And uh, we have a hero here, Yuto Minami, uh, junior faculty at Osaka University. So, I mean, Francois and Ben know this very well. It's not just a result, okay? <laughs> it would take years to do some innovations in data analysis methodology. So I'm uh, very proud of these papers that we wrote. And uh, uh, so what is cosmic biophysics? Okay. Um, if the universe is filled with dark matter and dark energy, which will violate parity symmetry, okay? And they decouple to photons, they behave, space filled with dark matter and dark energy would behave as if it were a crystal, like sapphire. So uh, when we have biofringent material like a sapphire, you have a laser light with known polarization direction and you shoot it to the laser, uh, shoot it to the sapphire and you observe the light comes out and plane of linear polarization will be rotated okay? because velocity, angular velocity of uh, uh, phase velocity is the right-handed, left-handed circular <coughs> polarization states will propagate differently in sapphire because it has different refractive indices depending on the polarization states. There's nothing magical about this. It's a well-known result, well-known phenomenon. It's used in industry, no, no new physics here, right? It's new physics if dark matter, dark energy behaves just like that. Now, a uh, concrete way that you can do it is that you have, let's say, something like a pseudo scalar field, which is a parity odd. So under the inversion of spatial coordinates, the pseudo scalar changes the sign. And when it does change sign like that, you can have, instead, in addition to this usual uh, coupling, so in this case, there's no coupling for photons. Here is FF is just a, a Maxwell uh, action. So just an action for free electromagnetic fields. F mu nu is of course written in terms of vector potential in the usual way. And then uh, that's it. But uh, when you have pseudo scalar that violates parity, you can have a coupling to this so called Chern Simon sum, F, F dual. The F dual, the Hodge dual, is uh, F, F mu nu times the completely anti symmetric tensor. Now you pause. What is this? Okay. <laughs> uh, is this new physics? And I tell you, no. This is a physics that we love. Well, maybe, maybe not all of us loves it. It's a pi -on, okay? Pi -on is a pseudo scalar. 
uh, and uh, pi young decays into two photons precisely through this couple. Okay. It's not apparent if you look at QCD Lagrangian, but as Weinberg showed us, when you take the low energy limit and get the effective action for pi young, this term appears. We all, you know, for pi young, this G is completely well determined, okay? Determined by the decay constant of uh, pi young uh, and so on, and, and the uh, fine structure constant. So uh, then you take this kind of idea further and say, okay, what about you know, axion? So axion is a hypothetical yet to be discovered particle pseudo scatter, which was introduced to uh, solve the so-called CP problem of QCD. So it's been well studied, many, many decades, more than 50 years, okay? Uh, in our talk, has been shown to be an excellent candidate for both dark matter and dark matter. It's a well-studied area. So we're just asking this simple question, what if uh, this trans Simon's term do Is it me or somebody? <laughs> So, yeah, and just convince yourself, convince, convince you that, so you have electric and magnetic fields, uh, and when you write down FF, okay, uh, using the uh, magnetic field and electric field, so electric field is a vector, so it's parity odd, it changes sign under the inversion of spatial coordinates, magnetic field is a pseudo vector, so it doesn't change sign, it's parity even, when you square B and E, both are parity even, so as promised, usual Maxwell kinetic term is parity E. When you have FF dual, it's B dot E, so changes sign under the inversion of spatial coordinates, it's parity R, as promised. In order to keep the Lagrangian parity even over O, this theta field has to change sign under the inversion of spatial coordinates. This explains why you have a term like that. Yeah, it's a spe spe special property of pseudo scalar. Now, when this couples, right, just like a sapphire, yeah, uh, this term makes phase velocities of right and left handed polarization states different, leading to rotation in the linear polarization direction. It's called cosmic biofinics. Goes back to papers written by Carroll and uh, collaborators in Harabi and Stevie in the uh, early 1990s. Good. And uh, so, what does it really do? So let's look at the standard Maxwell theory and write down the line element just like that using conformal time eta instead of physical time t. Then uh, it looks just like Minkowski uh, equation for the propagation of wave. I take the right handed uh, coordinates with uh, z axis in the direction of propagation of photons. Then you can uh, write down right handed states and left-handed states, depending on how the polarization rotates, or in terms of helicity, a right-handed state is the plus helicity, left-handed state is the minus helicity. Then of course, uh, it, because vacuum doesn't care the uh, right or left, it's a Lorentz symmetric uh, state. Therefore, the dispersion relation will be the same, just omega equal k for both right and left states. But when you have this term, trans Simon's term, equation of motion picks up a new term, which depends on the helicity state. And it's very uh, reassuring that this term, okay, of course it's proportional to G, otherwise nothing happens. And it's actually proportional to theta prime. Prime is the uh, derivative with respect to conformal time. So you have to have theta that varies over time or space also. The reason is this FF dual. Okay? The reason why you haven't seen this yet before you, in usual, uh, usual physics is that this FF dual is actually a total derivative. You can write this term in terms of divergence of the vector. And when you integrate this over the space time to get action, this drops. Okay? It becomes a surface term. So if you just had this, nothing happens. <laughs> uh, now, if you go to nonlinear electrodynamics, you actually have fx to the square, and also fx square as a high order term. This would do something interesting. 
but not at this level. That's why you haven't seen this yet. So because it's the total derivative, unless theta is space-time independent, nothing happens. So that's why in equation motion, it has to have theta prime. Theta has to vary. Now, after this, okay, you can do the uh, high school algebra. So you just have this square of something, you make a square, drop the, drop the high order term. Then you have phase velocity, omega over k, that depends on the electricity state. And then let me tell you right away that this term is absolutely tiny. Okay, so this is of order at most the ratio of the photon wavelengths and the size of the visible units. So for CND experiments, this is like a one centimeter divided by 14 units. Absolutely tiny, okay? <laughs> but this effect accumulates over 14 billion years. So this will make the effect finally uh, observable to us, yeah? So when you have the, uh, yes? I can also repeat the question. Yeah. I, what if these things are changing in space? Excellent question. So in fact, although I'm writing this in terms of a uh, partial derivative of theta, if you do the uh, real derivation, including spatial variation, this becomes a total derivative. So, uh, so you, the solution is you have theta at emission minus theta observed, both spatial variant, and that's all. It does accumulate because along the elytocrone, right? It just, <laughs> yeah, so this accumulates because you just have the uh, difference between fields at emission and observation, both are spatially varying. Yeah? So what you're sensitive to is a difference in space, a difference in uh, fields. Now, if fields oscillates, right, uh, then effect gets diminished, that's, that's true. Okay? So that's an important point when we're talking about implications for dark matter and dark energy. Now, uh, let me tell you something actually quite annoying for CND scientists and actually for International Astronomical Union. So Ben knows very well. <laughs> so let's say uh, here, plane of linear polarization rotates by angle psi, okay? That's just the uh, angular frequencies uh, difference integrate over time. Now this, what do I mean by this plane of linear polarization? So, uh, so right-handed coordinates and then uh, Z axis in the direction of propagation direction of photons. Okay, so in this sign, therefore, would be clockwise rotation from the point of view of source, okay? Because right-handed is a plus, yeah? So from me, it's clockwise rotation, but from you, it's a counter-clockwise rotation in the sky. So International Astronomical Union uses very sensible <laughs> Sign convention for CN uh, for the uh, angle of polarization, namely, when you have a, a, a right handed polarization uh, states, then that would be counterclockwise in the sky. It's very sensible. Uh, we blame Ben Vandel here for introducing the different sign convention, or well, not just him, by the way, I'm just <laughs> uh, teasing him, but uh, uh, he'll fix. Uh, decided to admit, and it, I think it's influenced by Zarkarega Sensei, or you know, maybe you can tell us a whole story later. He decided to admit the different sign convention. That's okay. Uh, therefore, uh, the uh, for CMB, positive uh, polarization angle means clockwise rotation in the sky. Okay. So hence, my diagram here. So positive beta is the minus of psi. Okay. So when you see positive beta from my talk, you can't think of this as IAU, that's counterclockwise, it's clockwise, okay? None of these things matters until today uh, because CMB observables, they are all parity even so far. And this never matters. Now it matters, and that's why uh, I'm, I'm telling you about this, okay? 
So in the fun, so to recap uh, this, when you have this Chan Simons term, uh, this field evolves and you integrate over time and you get angle. So this accumulates over time and this theta can be dark matter or dark energy. Okay, so that's really excellent. And uh, just knowing okay, that uh, dark matter or dark energy or even both a parity violet and pseudo scatter would be a breakthrough. Okay? That will tell us a lot about physics. For dark energy, the implication is even more profound because this immediately rules out cosmological constant. It's a dynamical field. Okay? Otherwise, nothing happens. Immediately rules out. Okay? So, uh, so this has a far reaching consequences for theory of vector quantum gravity, for example. So there's a lot of motivation, but uh, you know, actually none of that thing that bothered me because uh, I much simpler minded person. I learned, you know, in university that weak interaction violates parity. What? Like the right, left, what? Uh, if weak interaction violates parity, why can't universe violate parity? Okay, so let's look. Whatever people say, let's look, and <laughs> because we can. Uh, so that's a beautiful temperature fluctuation map of Planck, but the uh, current state of the art is really the polarization. So the uh, directions of lines are uh, polarization directions, and then uh, lines, the lengths of the lines will be the strength of the polarization. That's really nice. Then, uh, because we, are, we want to talk about parity violation, we want to define parity against this. Okay. So instead of talking about just this kind of an orientation of polarization, we talk about patterns which will form eigenstates states of parity called E and B naught. So what you do is you look at sky and do the Fourier decomposition. So let's say you have hot cold, hot cold that you know defines some kind of uh, direction of the Fourier vector. Of course, the other universe is not just plane wave, single plane wave, just superpositional plane waves. But you can always decompose these patterns into Fourier modes. Then along the Fourier modes, okay, direction of the wave vector, you define E modes, which are either parallel or perpendicular to the uh, wave vector. Or B mode, which are 45 degree tilted. And you can convince yourself that it's a party eigenstate, but it's a party, party flip, okay? E doesn't change sign, B changes sign, so indeed that's the point, you know, party eigenstate, okay? Very nice. Then, uh, oh, then of course, okay, uh, another uh, thing of C and B community. We now have to really blame Sergei and Balikariaga. Uh, so, this E and B modes have nothing to do with electric and magnetic fields uh, because, uh, it, okay, so it's even confusing that uh, electric fields are the odd because it's a vector, but here E mode is the one that part E. So just, just you know, uh, don't bother. Just swallow. Okay, fine. So <laughs> uh, E mod parity even B mod parity odd from now. Okay, forget electromagnetic fields. Then when you form the power spectra, E is parity even. Square of it is parity even. B is parity odd, but the square of that is parity even. Temperature is parity even. T is also parity even. So all of these combinations, E mod B mod T E power spectra, they're all parity even. That's why you've seen this so many times by now, Abiyate in particular. TB and EB are parity odd. When you invert the spatial coordinates, TB and EB will change sign. In the parity conserving universe, these two quantities must be equal. Okay? So TB is equal to minus TB. The only way that happens is TB is zero. Therefore, uh, measurements of these will be an excellent and fairly clean proof of parity violation in, in the universe. So I look at you know uh, history of CMB research. It's pretty amazing. The first detection of uh, an isotropy was made in 1992 uh, by Kobe satellite. We are now in 2022, so it's been 30 years, and it took only 30 years to go from this to this. Okay, seven orders of magnitude improvement in the uh, power spectrum measurement. And the uh, noise level of experiments dropped exponentially with time by three orders of magnitude over the last two decades. 
if you weren't for the exciting CMB research, it wouldn't have been possible. Okay? So in order to enable this, uh, people made tremendous innovations in microwave sensor technology, which you wouldn't need for social application. Uh, so really it's a, a experimental driven, uh, curiosity driven thing. And were really, you know, for example, if you wanted to probe the physical physics of inflation, you wanted to measure this, you know, very nice gravitational wave induced B mode. Now you don't see TB or EB here, right? Because it hasn't been really been detected and people didn't, didn't really pay much attention to it. But now maybe time to look at that. Uh, so when you rotate the uh, plane of linear polarization, then E and B, uh, mix okay. so observed observed EMB will be related to the intrinsic EMB on the right hand side through this phase. Then, even if you didn't have any B initially, you would see B by simply rotating E to B. Okay, so sine to beta, beta is pretty tiny. So, basically, this tells you that B observed is E times two times B up two times beta and so on, okay? Then you form EB correlation. Now you, even if EB intrinsic is zero, E observed times B observed average wouldn't be zero. And in fact, not only e, EB, but also e, 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 and BB are all modified. And what you can see is that EB is given by difference between E and B. And this is actually, this makes a lot of sense. Right, because biofringence only mixes them, it doesn't create anything. Okay, so if you had equal amounts of E and B initially, after mixing, you still have equal amounts of E and B and no parity violation. So if you have randomly oriented a polarization in the sky, completely random, no, no correlation, then you have E power spectrum is equal to B power spectrum. Now you rotate this random orientation by uniform angle beta. It's still random. <laughs> so no preferred direction, yeah? No preferred uh, parity state. So you really, you really have to have an asymmetry between E and B, which we actually do in our sky because the universe is preferentially, you know, dominated by density fluctuation. So E is much, much bigger than B. So this, uh, this condition is satisfied. So if you had, based on your EV observed, there's a difference between EE observed and BB observed. Okay? It's nice that it's all related to observables. You don't have to assume any model. Yeah? The intrinsic EV correlation at the surface of Russell's scattering, okay? which will be exciting to find also. So both beta and the CLEV on the right-hand side would be the key to the, would be the uh, probe of the, of the new physics, both of them. So why hasn't it been done? It, it has been done okay, a lot of times, including myself in doubling up error. Uh, but it's just that, you know, uh, is, you know, when you're drunk, so I, like I was last, last night <laughs> at Rutake, uh, you know, you're like, uh, I'm a, so, everything is rotated. Okay, so it's like uh, linear polarization is coming. It looks like it's rotated. Is it rotated genuinely or just my, my head is slightly turbid. Okay, looks like rotating. Okay, All right. <laughs> so you you don't know, right? So if you make a wonderful plank focal plane, and then you left for dinner, and somebody came in and just rotated the focal plane, you didn't tell you, okay? And then you launch the dumb thing, and then you observe the uh, polarization. Oh, oh, polarization is rotated, but it, but the, the, that was not because nature. Uh, gives you the rotation of polarization, but somebody rotated the focal plane without telling you. Okay, so uh, you really have to know how the polarization sensitive directions of detectors are related to the uh, polarization direction in the sky very well. Otherwise, you cannot measure beta, you can only measure some of so called miscalibration angle alpha and beta. That's why, okay, uh, there are lots of, the so first measurement of this kind was done by Feng et al. in 2006. So I liked it very much. So we decided to do it by 
without them up as well, and then not finding anything, then quad, okay, and, and then and many other measurements in the meantime. Now, lately, still, the Planck had you know six sigma detection of angle, polar bear minus three sigma, <laughs> SPT 15 sigma, and so on, but with all different values, okay. And that's because you're not measuring beta, you're actually measuring alpha plus beta. So you really have to know how well you know alpha. For example, for Dublin map, we knew it only down to 1.5 degrees, quad half a degree, Planck, each detector had uncertainty of angular calibration. When you combine many channels, you can beat down the uh, uncertainty by some square root of n, then they are assigned 0.3 degree, so accommodate 0.3 degree. And then other measurements didn't really have this kind of uh, characterize misguided relation. So they even, for example, polar V and SPD collaborations, they use this to determine not beta but alpha. And so they assume that beta is zero, and then they use this measurement to fix alpha. So clearly, this is an issue. But then, if you remember the physics of cosmic biophysics, it is the fact that photons traveled. 13 to 14 billion years ago, like this, okay? This effect accumulates. So if you look at, uh, you know, of course, if you look at the uh, beautiful CMB temperature at the polarization map like this, you know, you're not seeing the whole thing because it's this uh, interstellar medium polarization was removed, real sky looks like that. And then this uh, polarization from the thermal dust emission aligned with magnetic fields, they are emitted right there. You know, it's within 100,000 light years, right? So these photons traveled only tens of thousands of uh, light years, not 13 to 14 billion years. So you can completely ignore uh, the biofringence for those light coming from Milky Way. So we use that, okay? So foreground is rotated only by alpha. CMB is rotated by both alpha and beta. And but we don't know foreground, okay? We don't really have knowledge. We don't have physics, fundamental physics of foreground. Luckily, you can relate, as I promised already before, observe the EB to observe the difference between E and BB. Okay? You don't have to assume anything for foreground for E or B. That's nice. That will give you alpha. But we know a lot about CMB. Okay? So you use the knowledge of CMB to break the dependency between alpha and beta. Okay? So you CMB measures alpha plus beta, foreground only measures alpha. You use knowledge of CMB to extract beta out of that. Plus, you have CMB intrinsic uh, EV correlation at the surface of lots of stuff. That's a major discovery if you can make that discovery. So, for my talk, I'll just you know, leave this as a dessert. Okay, I'm still in the middle of the second course, enjoying it very much. This will be you know, my maybe even be like uh, after dinner liquor okay. <laughs> uh, cognac that's cognac this one is a beast okay this is like a big steak in front of me so uh uh intrinsic foreground ea correlation and get to that it's a fascinating uh, science behind this all right so how does it work uh, in simulation okay it's actually a very nice thing to see when you don't have any information of foreground or any other calibrations, CMB will give you alpha plus beta. So horizontal axis is alpha, vertical axis is beta, and CMB will give you this, this line, okay? And because CMB is very well measured, the thickness of this uh, contour is basically zero. So very well determined. Alpha plus beta is determined to infinite precision. CMB dominates the channel, like 120 gigahertz, it'd be like that. But as you then foreground, because there's a bit of foreground there still, you, you cut the contour in alpha dimension that will determine the data. That's basically how this works. When you go to 200 gigahertz, where dust is slightly brighter, you determine alpha beta because you have more access to foreground emission. As you go to 240 gigahertz, you even get more access to dust. But when you go to 340 gigahertz, you have no access to CMB. You have a lot of access to foreground, so you can determine alpha, but you have no access to CMB, so you cannot determine alpha plus beta. So you combine all of these data to 
break the degeneracy and you can calibrate instrument at each of these frequencies and still get overall angle that's big all right so uh, we developed this methodology and then want it uh, because not only the methodology right uh, we have the data so we thought that we will just apply this to Planck data as a proof of concept didn't expect to find anything important we still didn't find anything important you know 2.4 sigma okay <laughs> i've spent a lot of I have a lot of experience dealing with 2.4 sigma and going away like a non gauss energy. <laughs> so <laughs> I know exactly what the 2.4 sigma means. Uh, all right. So, nonetheless, right, this was interesting. And, uh, and what we find also is that these are miscalibration angles or Planck detectors at each frequency. And you see that they are very well calibrated. <laughs> I, they assigned the, uh, something like one degree for each. No, systematic uncertainty. They are all very generous, I think. No. Uh, engineers did it really, really well. <laughs> very impressive when I first saw, saw that. Um, okay. So, can I see 2.4 sigma by R? Okay. Answer is no, but let me, let me try as a sanity check also. Uh, so, this is E minus BB observed. Red is the observed the difference between E and E B. Blue is the C and B theory. Okay. So what we do is to uh, see the difference between them, and this will be foreground. Okay. So this difference in the E B will be the signature of alpha. So we use that to uh, calibrate, calibrate the instrument and get data from blue. So remember that, okay? So difference between blue and red goes up, it blows up as we go to low amount on large angular scales, foreground, foreground is brighter. So the important thing is foreground blows up as we go to lower mountains. If what we are seeing is a miscalibration angle, EB will blow up as we go to lower mountains. Like this, it's a tiny you know, blip here going up on the top right panel. Uh, alpha is positive. Here, alpha is negative, okay? Because miscalibration angles don't have to be the same for all, all frequencies. But the point is, they don't blow up as much as they should to explain all the data, yeah? You don't see much EB from the foreground. I think that's the important point, important message here. Then the rest can be attributed to C and B. And now it's the, like a psychological test because the, this uh, um, E mode polarization is coming from sound waves. There's an acoustic oscillation. Do you see an oscillation in the data? Yeah, kind of. <laughs> 2.4 signal, okay, remember that. At least it gave, gave us some confidence. Now, looking into the plots is always useful to convince yourself that your code is working pretty well. How about the foreground EV? So currently we are saying that all of the EV that we are seeing here from the foreground is due to alpha miscalibration. But if there was intrinsic EV correlation, some of the alpha we see is the intrinsic uh, foreground EV. So let's parameterize the uh, foreground angle by gamma. So if the foreground EV is positive, gamma is positive. Then our method foreground would yield not alpha, but alpha plus gamma. C and B still yields alpha plus beta. So when you take the difference, it's now beta minus gamma that we are measuring, not just gamma, not just beta. If foreground has positive EV, our measurement is a lower bound. Planck made a surprising discovery of TB, parity violating intensity B mode polarization correlation from dust emission, positive. TE was also found from dust in positive. If TE was positive and TB was positive, there's every reason to expect that EB is also positive. 
So after seeing that result, we said, okay, maybe something is there. Okay. If this was not the case, okay, if TB dust was negative, I wouldn't have bothered to kind of present this to you okay, today. <laughs> so because EB was positive, I thought, okay, no, maybe something interesting was there. But more innovations were needed to understand better the foreground and also the uh, more data were needed. So the everything I presented uh, and done by this uh, uh, Yuto Minami, this was legacy release of Planck 2018 called PR3, public release three. Then Planck collaboration uh, used the supercomputing power in Berkeley to reprocess uh, both low frequency, high frequency data, try to better characterize systematics, use more data, 10% more data, or something like that, to reduce the overall noise level in the, uh, systematics uh, errors. And then, so we expected that this would lead to smaller uncertainty in data. And I'm very proud that this project, you know, has double corresponding authors, both of PhD students. One is Patricia in San Daniel, Spain, and the other in Johannes in Oslo. It's pretty international team as well. And, uh, and it's such a wonderful thing to see this super motivated young people uh, doing this all this work. And Patricia presented this work at the Morion meeting uh, a couple of weeks ago, I think. Uh, and uh, apparently the talk was very successful. Okay, so uh, this public release four called N5 lead processing. Uh, we're still using high frequency data, so 400 to 353. These maps have lower noise level and better characterized systematics. Then we also uh, measure power spectra from so called AB split. So you have multiple detectors per frequency. We, we divide these detectors into two sets, independent noise, and then cross correlate to remove any kind of common modes uh, that may be there. Then, unlike the uh, PR3 analysis, where we focus our attention to only full sky data, we looked at um, uh, masks, galactic masks, to see what the uh, foreground is doing. Uh, so, these are the masks that we used. And uh, then, moreover, uh, you know, I have a full respect and full, full trust for Yuto Minami, but there's always a concern of the bug. Okay. So. <laughs> So I decided to ask four people to independently develop pipelines. So uh, many things are in fact different. You know, codes that are used for computing power spectra are different for the spies, nanostar, expo, and the way that the likelihood is maximized is different. One is analytic, another is MCMC. And of course, you know, codes being written by different people, all kinds of things uh, could be changed. Yeah? So they all gave us the same answer, okay? Then that's great. And then uncertainty was reduced from 0.14 to 0.11. Significance of the result went up from 2.4 to 2.7. Now, uh, having been invested so much on uh, non gauss energy business, what I learned uh, was that when signal was a statistical fluke, as you make, as you collect more data, and as you make more innovation in data analysis, significant goes down. It don't happen here. Okay, so as you include more data and as you make more innovation in data analysis, significance went up slightly, yes, but nonetheless, it did go up. So these uh, colored lines are four pipelines. You know, they're all agree. Now I'm going to mask more sky. Okay, then the inferred value of beta dropped even to negative values. If you interpret this as beta minus gamma instead of beta, this makes perfect sense because foreground EV is positive. Okay. Now, that once you correct that, you know, foreground EV, you recover black line, they're all positive again. Okay, so that's pretty nice. Let's dig deeper in there. So when you have foreground, then not only the alpha that gives you the program, but you have intrinsic program. You have cosine sine. So let's 
remember high school uh, trigonometry sine cosine sine is phase this phase now is ed divided by e minus vd the new angle gamma so instead of alpha we make alpha plus gamma as a focus so this gamma depends on multiples okay. if ed is completely proportional to e minus vd gamma will be independent of multiple it's completely degenerate with alpha okay. so uh then if TD dust was positive, ED, TD was positive, gamma should be positive. So indeed, theta minus gamma should decrease. Now, uh, so that's a fascinating physics of dust water right there. Okay. Uh, how do we model this effect, angle gamma? We don't know. <laughs> it's a new, I think it's a new subject in the new science for drastic dust physics. Very nice. And uh, nonetheless, there are a few attempts, actually two attempts, precisely two. Uh, and uh, to uh, explain this and let me tell you. But, uh, but uh, I want to stress that uh, we don't really rely on that kind of physics model. Okay? Yeah, we yeah, actually, yeah, all yeah, I yeah, say yeah, is yeah, ED yeah. is proportional to TD. That's all. And we have a free amplitude to fit for. Okay? Then you undo most of the foregrounds. Uh, doing, but you know that's a bit uh, uncomfortable without really knowing what we are doing. So that's why having a physics model always helps. Twenty-one centimeter observations revealed that hydrogen clouds within our galaxy exist in the forms of thin filaments. No one knew why. The turbulence, the magnetic fields, now looks more like a magnetic fields here. Okay. Filaments are aligned with magnetic fields. If they do that, dust is also aligned with magnetic fields. They produce polarization in perpendicular direction of the magnetic field direction. When you have a thin hydrogen filament like this, is bright, it's emitting a lot of emission here, red, then you have magnetic field threading it in this arrow direction. So in the top panel, it's parallel to the filamentary direction. Then polarization direction will be perpendicular to this little horizontal line is a polarization direction. Now, uh, E mode is parallel or perpendicular to the wave number direction. In this example, you see white, red, white. This defines the wave vector direction going in a horizontal direction. This polarization is parallel to wave number. That's positive E, E positive, but there's no B. If the filaments are perfectly aligned with magnetic fields, you see TE correlation, positive, but no TB. When magnetic fields are slightly misaligned by whatever mechanism that we don't know, you generate B positive when angles are small. Uh, so basically, if you have a slight misalignment, you expect to see TE and TB and EB all positive, all same sign. Okay. Now, why are they misaligned? Nobody knows. And why do you have more of these as you must more? Nobody knows. And it's completely crazy. To th I think it's completely reasonable to actually think that, that there shouldn't be any effect like that. If you have hundreds of Milky Ways, if you have access to observations of hundreds of Milky Ways and average over this, you're not going to get this. Okay? It's just that our Milky Way happens to give you by chance, after averaging over many, many uh, filaments, they give you, you know, some, some balance, okay? Ensemble average-wise, they should vanish. But uh, because we have finite number of filaments in the star, on average, they give you right or left or whatever, right? So <laughs> that's the only interpretation I can come up with. 
And, uh, and moreover, okay, this might also explain why you get more of these effects as you mask more, okay? So you get less and less filaments to average over, maybe, you know, uh, statistical fluctuation are bigger, you have preference to give you, you know, this misalignment. Who knows? Nobody knows, okay? But uh, uh, fascinating subject, nonetheless. So if you do that, okay, then we basically say, okay, EV is proportional to TV, that's all. Then let's have free amplitude, which, so we are not taking this model as fixed. Okay, this is just a template. And you have a free amplitude to fit for. This is a slowly varying amplitude. Uh, we have four multiple bins to fit for. Then we undo this. So that was pretty amazing. Okay, so uh, we just undo it. Okay, the, the, all of the negative things went out to, to positive. Now you, you ask this, yes. <laughs> oh, sorry to interrupt again. Uh, it's just a question about this explanation that you were suggesting. So you say if you mask more, somehow because you have a smaller sample, you expect the uh, expectation value of uh, the average that you're doing to, to yield a bigger gamma. But I would expect it to fluctuate as you mask more because yeah, the yeah. regions that you mask, they should, they, yeah. they have no reason that yeah, they all go yeah, to the same that's direction. Right. So it is a fluctuation, precisely the fluctuation. When you have uh, like intrinsic missile element variation, sigma, you have any filaments. It's sigma over square root of n. That remains after mass, right? It's not going to be zero. They fluctuate within the sigma over square root of n. When you have fewer filaments, sigma over square root of n will be bigger. So by chance, <laughs> you see less cancellation on average. I mean, that's one interpretation. Yeah, so the, que to, yeah, yes. the question is, instead of masking like this, did we mask the sky, the north, south, east, west, or some funny ways? Yes, we did that. And, uh, but then we really start losing statistics. <laughs> Error was so big that anything was consistent. But yes, uh, that's a good point. Of course, we looked at, in fact, we're even uh, writing up a paper about spatial variations of these effects over the sky because that's an important important thing yes indeed but you know i mean this is a speculation okay uh in fact i don't even know if that's the responsible thing or um oh one thing maybe i forgot to say uh so this uh this uh, uh person who suggested so this so susan clark and, and her collaborators so they show that when you look at the full scan uh, gamma oscillates over multiples. Uh, so this angle gamma here is very, very free, uh, multiple dependent. Alpha is multiple independent. That's why we can break, that's why they don't do much harm on larger scales. As you go to muscle sky, for whatever reason, nobody knows, gamma becomes nearly multiple independent. And uh, we just don't know why. I mean, this must be related to different physical properties of distribution of hydrogen clouds on the plane and off the plane. And there's every reason to expect such a thing does exist. <laughs> uh, so, so, I mean, this is, this is so fascinating, yeah? So, as a result, when you look at the full sky, because that seems least affected by the, okay, the correction you have to make is big, on, on, uh, on smaller f sky. If you look at full sky result, and then signal went up, error bar didn't change. This is statistics only error bar, okay? Not, not yet. Uh, we didn't account for somehow the systematics due to this modeling, but somehow the likelihood gave us this. It's now 3.3 signal, okay? So as we make more innovation in data analysis, significance went up. Uh, but you know, we don't, we're not claiming actually that this is the value. We don't really know 
which x i value to choose really so i mean you you just pick whatever you want <laughs> and if you pick this one there's no evidence for this x you pick this one there's 3.3 sigma more work needs to be done now uh johannes so uh he had this uh, great idea that why don't we look at the frequency dependence the photon frequency dependence because if it's a faraday rotation it's frequency to the minus two power if it's quantum gravity correction at the Planck scale it's new square or well, it can also have new to the one power so looking at frequency dependence was an important thing so to enable that he added low frequency data in, in addition to high frequency you know for the first time therefore he was able to use all the Planck data to measure beta as a function of frequency okay so i encourage him to write a single author paper of this a beautiful paper no evidence for frequency dependence which was not trivial at all and there's no foreground correction here okay low frequency is synchrotron not even dust <laughs> okay the fact that they give you consistent answer is not trivial so this seems like we're getting cosmological signal maybe and uh, in fact adding LFI reduced error bar from 0.11 to 0.10 at this point every 10 percent reduction error matters okay they were working on adding w map and this will further reduce the error bar, and uh, that's very nice so let me conclude uh so it's a 2.7 sigma nearly full sky result and if you correct for foreground it's 3.3 sigma now this plus minus 0.11 is statistics only okay we're not yet accounting for systematic uncertainty due to foreground so we'd rather love to have plus minus 0.11 plus minus something okay that's the that's the next challenge good news i didn't have time to, to go into it uh so this uh PR4 comes with lots of simulations that include all the known instrumental systematics of the plant. We did extensive analysis, that's Patricia's work, uh, extensive work to, to look into any kind of instrumental effect that will impact beta. And results show that the impact of known systematics on beta is negative compared to the uncertainty, statistical uncertainty. So that was another milestone we had and no evidence for frequency dependence that's very nice so currently we seem to have fairly robust signal at three sigma level from Planck. so if it's confirmed as a cosmological signal uh it would have important implications for fundamental physics now what's next okay uh i would argue that we should abandon this technique this is what's a desperate att attempt to to squeeze the last bit of exciting science from Planck. If we were to do this again, we just calibrate the instrument, okay? Just do better at calibration, okay? And if you can calibrate your detector and telescope and the whole thing to 0.05 degree level, that's three arc minutes. You can test this without worrying about horizon uh, and may discover this at five sigma. What you find zero. Okay, fine, that's science, okay? So I'll stop here, thank you very much. All right, uh, so it's actually a miracle that Planck, which was not designed for polarization, was calibrated that well. Yeah, 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 yeah. Uh, it's Very actually impressive. a tribute to the people that did this. Yeah, yeah, uh, it's yeah, indeed. It's completely amazing that. Yeah, it's completely amazing. It's, yeah. On it's the other very end, well done. Yeah, very well made. <laughs> uh, on the other end, uh, the kind of calibration accuracy that you are talking about is not easy. Uh, well, I mean, uh, Francois, we are theorists, okay? So <laughs> don't underestimate <laughs> genius of instrumentalist because i mean look at the cmb right this historical progress nobody thought of innovation <laughs> in i agree technology. but that may take some special doing including possibly nanosat or, or yeah 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 let's go I to mean, funding there, agency there are a number yeah. of ideas to try to 
precisely uh, devote instrumental yeah. uh, stamina to this problem. Yeah. So who wants to ask questions, comments? There is, can you give the microphone? Um, this, the, the value of vector that you are, you are finding is really fundamental from, uh, from a sort of action life. Huh? Then um, we, we should have to see it huh, in uh, cosmological sources, huh? especially in the synchrotron uh, emission from, for instance, gamma ray bursts, which can come from, we can observe them from very far and they, ha they have linear polarization. Therefore, uh, it will be very interesting to look at this. Uh, yes. Uh, yes. Yes, yes. Yeah, let me repeat the question. So uh, she was asking, uh, basically, to confirm this, why don't we look at polarization of astrophysical sources such as gamma rays? People have looked at, looked at it. Now, and in fact, this uh, very first paper by Carol et al, they looked at the uh, polarization of radio, uh, radio sources. But of course, to do this, you need to know the intrinsic direction of polarization, which you, you don't know. Okay? So what the gamma ray bars people did was look at energy dependence of polarization direction. Because fundamental physics will tell you, the like quantum gravity will tell you that polarization direction rotates uh, differently for different energies like new, new, new energy square, for example. That you can do without knowing the intrinsic uh, orientation of the polarization. Faraday rotation, similarly, you can measure the intergalactic magnetic fields using Faraday rotation without knowing intrinsic orientation of polarization because this effect is energy dependent. This beta we're talking about axiom physics is energy independent. That's why it's hard to do for radio galaxies or gamma ray first of which we don't know the orientation of the intrinsic polarization. We could do it in X-ray, then we could do because because simply that the for the X-ray we know we have a very we know really the direction that so I think that it will be very interesting to consider yeah. it for the future uh, future instrumentation. So she is she is saying that uh, for jets, the polarization coming from the jets, uh, we must know the polarization direction pretty well. Well, to within three arc minutes, I'm not so sure actually. <laughs> so uh, uh, yeah, it's roughly aligned. Yes. So what people have done for radio, okay, radio astronomy is precisely that. They say polarization is really the jets. No, they did very well actually to within few degrees, so not Seattle. <laughs> okay, now we have uh, oh Nick Kaiser has dropped from the from the questions, but uh, Francois Boulanger from uh, from uh, I guess from ONS right now. Um, can you? Can you speak, Francois? Ask uh, yes, uh, thank you, Francois. Uh, hi, Eichiro. Thank you very much hi. for this very stimulating uh, talk. I have a question about, about the slide you are just showing on the screen. Uh, I don't understand why, why your uncertainty on alpha doesn't depend on frequency, because I would have expected that uh, you, have, you get a better signal to noise on the dust uh, signal uh, at the highest frequency. So I will ha have expected that the uncertainty on alpha will increase towards uh, from 353 to 100 gigahertz. So you, you meant gamma doesn't depend on frequency. Well, well misunderstood. Alpha, it, of course, does depend on frequency, like like here. But alpha, gamma, alpha is your is your error on the on the instruments on the instruments which you determine, assuming that there is no EB for a galactic emission. This this does have intrinsic foreground EB. This table, yeah, you're seeing now. Yes. Has intrinsic EV over hover. It does. Uh, so this 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 table includes the model for the galactic yes. EV. So this a, a coefficient you see at the bottom, these are all fitting coefficients for dust EV. 
But what I don't understand is that you, I will ex have expected that the galactic uh, foreground can be used to constrain the error on the polarization angles very well at 353, but not so well at 100 gigahertz because the signal is so much lower in terms of signal to noise. Ah, okay. So, uh, good. Uh, yeah, you are actually right because 100 gigahertz has a bigger error bar, right? Point plus minus 0.13 as opposed to 0.10 for 333. But uh, uh, what's missing here uh, in your reasoning is a cross correlation. We are using also cross correlation between 100 and 353. Okay. And that has a lot of dust in it. And that uh, uh, helps to calibrate both 353 and 100. So what you are, yeah, indeed, it's, it's hard to see the cross correlations from this kind of table, but uh, there are a lot of crosses that help you here. Okay, I understand. Okay, so we'll take another, before going to Sylvia, we'll go to another person in the room. So Ben. Yeah, thanks very much for a nice talk. Um, if the axions are dark matter, crystallizing on the theory part. Yes. Uh, then there could be correlations of, of the amplitude of the signal with large source clusters. Not, not quite, yeah, for interesting reasons, that was, but yeah, please continue. Right, because even though on average, everything averages out, there are some regions in the star that there's more density and other regions where there's less density. There are no possibilities to cross correlate with uh, integrated lab like, like lensing Yeah, and, and so, so yeah, that, so the Ben's question is, if uh, theta was dark matter, don't we, then if you can actually, reconstruct a spatial dependence of theta uh, from the sky, can we cross correlate that to the large scale structure uh, and make sure that it's actually dark matter? So that the, uh, there's a reason that uh, this uh, doesn't work is that uh, in order for this field to be dark matter, okay, their mass has to be bigger than the current Hubble expansion rate such that field is oscillating already by now. So this means that, and, and this beta, okay? So this is the solution of this integral is that your result is theta observed minus theta emitted. Now, if theta was dark matter, not dark energy, it would have decayed by now or been oscillating. So this theta observed would be zero. And what you are seeing is really theta emitted. So you are right in the sense that uh, the spatial variation of the dark matter has to exist. But that what you're looking at is a dark matter distribution at the surface of Russell's structure, not today. Having said that, there's an amazing thing you can do with this. Uh, this was a paper by Federike a uh, few years ago, uh, and his collaborators. Theta decays by now, so it's very small, but it's oscillating. Oscillating at a frequency that's relevant to the duration of CMB experiments. So this beta changes over time. <laughs> so you have the DC offset coming from value at the surface of the Russell scatter. Then on top of that, you have a sinusoidal oscillation coming from the dark matter oscillation today. I mean, that's fascinating. And the people looked at that using bicep data. Didn't find evidence yet. But that's really amazing, right? So this, this is a, not only spatial variation, but also time domain cosmology uh, using bioprinting. I think that's really fascinating. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Miss Sylvia, can you open your microphone? You can. Uh... Yes. Yes. Hi, Kier. Thank you very much for your for the nice talk. Uh, I could join only the second half, but I, I have a question uh, still on the plot where you show the evolution with F sky, and you ask, you know, which F sky to use. And I was wondering whether you, um, you know, did some more consistency checks in understanding, you know, whether you 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 expect these um, variations with different as F sky. Um, I mean, whether they are consistent. I mean, all of these points that you you show are correlated. Um, by eye, they seem consistent, but yeah. 
consistency like uh, you mean Be between the bl the black points uh, in different f sky you know going from 90 to i don't know 75 percent of the sky um Yes. You know, on simulations, do you expect from just fluctuations, would you expect such a difference or is this re really a signal? Um, not quite, because most of the data are in common. And so these, these points are pretty well correlated. Yes. Uh, having said that, by the way, Sylvia, uh, if someone asks me, does this mean we have detected? foreground EV? The answer is only marginal. It's still, despite the look, right, uh, the significance for EV correlation is still two to three signal level. So uh, in, in some sense, it, it, it's hard business to do consistency check more than what you see here. But uh, yeah, I mean, your question is of course a valid one. And we, we kept thinking about you know, what, what are the ways that we can really show that uh, this is proof that the foreground model is working well. Actually, let me uh, say one thing now taking advantage of this. So I didn't explain at all uh, the fact that uh, there are two, two black lines, okay? <laughs> so one is modeling EV, that's dashed, and that other is commander, that's dotted. Now the commander is a foreground model that Planck people use. Uh, so we have a model, okay, we, we assume Synchrotron is a parallel in frequency, and dust is a one component modified black body. So using that kind of model, you create a map of dust and synchrotron. So we took that model and then assumed that would be the true dust distribution. Then fit, they measure ED from that, no detection basically, but just use it and then fit for the data. Then you get dotted. And the amazing thing is, gave you the same answer as modeling EV up until the full sky. At full sky, they differ. But I think we know why, because commander never works over the full sky. <laughs> we know that it's not one component motor black body on the plane. So I think this shows that commander is fading where it should fail. <laughs> and, uh, but the rest, okay, uh, the agreement is amazing. And if, of, of, also, if you look at more uh, in detail, error bar we assign for commander is much, much smaller than error of our for modeling. The reason is commander being derived from the data implies that it's massively correlated with statistical fluctuations in the data. So when you try to fit for commander EV, the, uh, you are basically introducing, uh, reducing the correlation artificial and then gives you this kind of time error. But Sylvia, uh, to answer your question, this is probably the best consistency check we have performed. Okay, so completely different way of dealing with foreground EV gave you the same answer, except the very full stuff. Of course, that's the key, right? So, so we're still kind of uh, scratching our head how to convince ourselves that the full sky results is immune to foreground. But at this point, I think we should give up on foreground and just calibrate our instrument. My hope is that this kind of work stimulates uh, more effort in calibration and convince funding agency to give us 2 million euros for such an effort. I think this is a very, very <laughs> sane statement. Uh, we have been pretty involved in some of the data analysis on large scales uh, of the HFI instrument. And, and this is where pretty much all, all hell breaks loose in polarization. <laughs> so this is already a miracle to be yeah, able yeah. to do this. Uh, and I think at this point, we, we need to better calibrate future experiments. Yeah. I mean, that's, that's the point. Yeah. And two million is, is a small amount of money compared to all the rest. Yeah, and, and the implication could be on that, right? so, yeah. yeah. So does uh, is there anyone that wants to add an additional comment? Yes, Ben. Uh, Could you try L cut so low L? Yes, okay. yes, yes. Yeah. So yes, indeed. Uh, why L minimum was fifty one? <laughs> So the, 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 the first answer I can give you is this is what Planck people used. Second, we, we did vary both L minimum and L max. And the PR3 results uh, had some weird behavior below L minimum 51. But above L minimum 51, things stabilized. 
That's why we chose this one as well. It happens to coincide with Planck choice. For, for n pi, it was completely robust with respect to n minimum, even below 51. So, so that, that was good indication that the systematics in NPI was better, better characterized. Yeah, th thanks for that, that question. Well, actually, we know for a fact that NPI has improved, in particular, the LFI systematics at large scale mm -hmm. in, in a very definite way, which uh, there has been no debate in, in the chemo mm -hmm. in this. Uh, there, has, there are still some debates about the improvement on the uh, large scale improvement on HFI. Mm -hmm. uh, okay. But that's, but for LFI, <laughs> this is a proven fact. Yeah, yeah, I mean, good. It's, yeah. it's absolutely known. Yeah. Uh, so, anyway, that's the point. Anyway, thank you for this uh, stimulating talk. And, uh, well, I'm hoping to see the next generation uh, of experiments uh, measuring this. Okay, let's thank again, Chiro. Thank you very much.